everyone, welcome to our next training video in the book of Deuteronomy. That's our second last one actually, and it's on Deuteronomy 17 verses 14 to 20. Of course, we've been doing a helicopter sermon series in the book of Deuteronomy, but hopefully we're looking at all the crucial parts, or the parts that give us a big picture of the book, as well as the rest of the narrative of the Old Testament. And this one's important because it's the first time we have laws concerning the king. So read them. Um, but if you've just been reading the book of Deuteronomy and you read it out cold, it seems quite strange that Moses would be giving laws on the king. But when you know the context, when you've been reading since Genesis, actually, you will find it's quite different. There's been a build-up towards this. For example, when you read the book of Genesis multiple times, there's been promises of kings. As early as Abraham in Genesis 17, he says, I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make you into nations and kings shall come from you. I'll bless her, talking about Sarah, and moreover I'll give you a son by her, talking about Isaac, and I'll bless her and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Similarly to Jacob, God said, and kings shall come from your body, own body. And then lastly, a very important one is Genesis 49.10, where it leaves us on this kingly idea, is Jacob's words to Judah, a blessing to Judah, when he says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff between his feet, until tribute comes to him, until and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. So already there's an expectation that a king or kings will arise from Israel, particularly from Judah, and they will rule the nations. In Numbers, we have a similar thing, but very briefly, Balaam in his third oracle makes a reference to Jacob and her tents, and how lovely they are, and, because, and also because Jacob's king, his king, shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. So even there in the oracle, we have this expectation there will be a king and a kingdom. And if you've read Samuel before, you'll know in the narrative in Samuel, when Samuel is old, the elders of Israel come to him and then ask him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. And later on, when he warned them about this idea, they say, No, but there shall be a king over us, that we, a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go before us and fight our battles. So what we see is there's already been an expectation of a king. Later on the narrative, there will be a request for the king. And so in many ways, knowing these promises, and you could say looking forward, Moses gives us these stipulations in Deuteronomy 17, verse 14 to 20, even foreseeing the events here in 1 Samuel 8 of a future king. But the structure of the passage, quite simple. Um, verses 14 to 15 is Moses writing about the anticipation of the request of a king, which we just saw in 1 Samuel 8 happens. Basically, when will it happen is verse 14, when they're in the land, and when they've settled, they'll have a desire for it, which happens in 1 Samuel 8. And who will it be? Well, according to Moses, the one whom God chooses, and he will be one of their brothers. And in verses 16 to 20, we have a series of instructions for the king. That's the next part of the structure. And the first part's prohibitions for the king, verses 16 to 17, and verses 18 to 20 are demands for the king. But what's the message of this, of this passage? Um... Well, firstly, we already touched on verses 14 to 15 that basically the idea, the anticipation of a king, when they come into the land, the Lord will go out and you possess it and dwell in it. You'll say, I will set a king over me um, like all the nations around me. Then you may indeed set a king over you and the Lord your God will choose. Basically, here is the anticipation. A king will come. And of course, we find this is what happens. 1 Samuel 8, when they ask, please appoint us a king. But interestingly enough, Saul was there. That was presented to Solomon, to Samuel. But we discover in 1 Samuel 13 verse 4 that God will select someone according to his own heart. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people. So interestingly enough, although the initial desire for king was asked by the elders, it is God who will choose 
is king. And in the end, ultimately, as God reveals to Saul and to Samuel, it's the Davidic line or David. And to these kings, Saul was a failure, of course, in this area. But to these kings, to David's kings, the Davidic line, we have these prohibitions in verses 16 to 17. Well, there are three. Firstly, not acquire many horses. Now, interestingly enough, that's a reference to to military power. Horses were primarily used for pulling chariots, and they were a sign of military strength. And so this would be the idea of relying on military power and building up military prestige. All three of the prohibitions you will see here, by the way, for example, you shall acquire not, not many wives, turn away, you shall acquire, not acquire for himself excessive gold or silver, all three prohibitions were the typical things common in ancient Near Eastern cultures and their kings. And all three are prohibited for the kings of Israel. They will be distinct. They will not require massive military power and so rely on it rather than Yahweh. As he says, will cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return to that way again. The reference to Egypt is interesting. That's where God, of course, conquered Pharaoh's army, who were chariots, if you go read the narrative, in Exodus 14 and 15. So why rely on horses if God's already crushed them at the Exodus? But also Egypt will be a massive player and often a temptation for Israel to rely on them. And so there's this prohibition, don't. But also the next one is you shall not acquire many wives for yourselves, for himself. And interestingly enough, in ancient Eastern culture, it was quite common, and we see that in Solomon's reign, is that wives were given to kings in exchange for political alliances. They were sort of making ties between different nations. And they were also seen as a form of status and prestige. And Israel's kings actually prohibited don't do it unless their heart turn away. That's a massive reason. And then lastly, of course, that's an important point. Keep that in mind. The last one is, you shall acquire, you shall, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver or gold. He doesn't say you can't have silver and gold, but not excessive. And again, generally, the, in, the king is called not to be self-enriching by imposing high taxes or being a lord over his people, and so just enriching himself in the process. But interestingly enough, when we see what happens in the story of the king, Solomon actually breaks all three prohibitions. He accumulates horses for chariots, he accumulates wives, he accumulates wealth. All these things should indicate to us is that his heart will turn away, which is what actually happens in verse 4 of 1 Kings 11. In the end, his heart was turned away. And so actually, Deuteronomy 17 verse 40 to 20 is a commentary on Solomon's reign and actually a criticism and a judgment of his reign where it looks all positive when you read these two chapters in 1 Kings. Actually it's quite negative if you read it in the light of Deuteronomy 17 verse 14 to 20. And of course after Solomon's reign we see the collapse of the kingdom. So keep that in mind but even more important is verses 18 to 20 is what they're supposed to be doing. And this is, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of the law. So he has to write, and law, by the way, here is Torah or instruction, this Torah, which probably refers to Deuteronomy. He has to write a copy for himself, which is approved by the Levitical priests. Basically, it's under their auspices, the priests being God's custodians of the Torah and his, uh, and his witnesses as he copies this. Which again shows that this king is not really the supreme king of Israel, but he's just a vassal king, an under-shepherd of the true shepherd, which is Yahweh. And of course, it shall be with him is another stipulation. He shall never keep this Torah locked up somewhere. He will carry it with him. It's sort of reminiscent of Deuteronomy 6. Write it on your foreheads or tie it on your foreheads and put it on your homes. You shall not ignore this law. He will be constantly reminded who is king and where he needs to find guidance. And lastly, he shall read it all the days of his life. Sadly, of course, only a few of Israel's leaders and kings are shown to have applied this wholeheartedly. Joshua is a leader who clearly applied it. Ezekiah, another one, and Josiah especially. 
Of course, we can mention David if you read his Psalms. But ultimately, very few of the kings wholeheartedly applied these principles. And that's the tragedy of the story. A king who is not self-enriching and who is fully dedicated to Yahweh, fearing God, as we read further on here, and seeing his brothers as his equals, and not swerving to the left or to the right. Israel didn't really have kings like that. Even the kings like Hezekiah and Josiah had chinks in their armor. And even David, the great archetype of king, had many chinks in his armor. And so there was this expectation in the prophets of a future king who will actually live according to these stipulations, the servant of the Lord. And when we get to the New Testament, there are so many links to this passage in Jesus. Um, you've got mo more of them in your leader's notes. I'm just going to highlight one. I know that relates to us as well. But maybe just interestingly is to see how Christ Jesus, who of course is the Christ, the Messiah, though he was in the form of God, remember he is God himself. He is the king of the cosmos. He created the universe. He's got all the wealth there is. More than Solomon. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but what? He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And then look what he did. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. What I want to highlight here for you is this. Firstly, Jesus did not self-enrich himself as or self-enrich himself as the kings of Israel did, or Solomon especially, but he actually emptied himself. He let go of his wealth. He became a servant. And also he was obedient exactly to his father, to the bitter end, to the point of death, even death on a cross. And actually both sides, the prohibitions and the stipulations of the king, we see how Jesus fulfills both of them. He, as one of his brothers, he's a servant to his brothers, who does not enrich himself and remains perfectly obedient to his father. And of course, it's only, it's only such a life that is truly a king after God's own heart. And therefore we see in verses 9 to 11 what God thinks of Jesus' example. As king, God exalted him. And he bestowed him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven on the earth and confess that Jesus is Lord, he's Adonai, he's the sovereign one. Because he alone fulfills the stipulations. He alone can be God's Adonai, his Lord, his King, to the glory of God the Father. Because of his humility, his self-sacrificial life and his obedience. And interesting enough, we as his people are called to emulate his example, to follow our king. We need to be united is one point. But then interesting enough is not to be proud with selfish ambition or conceit, thinking ourselves better than others, but actually in humility count others more significant than yourselves. To not think of ourselves, exalt ourselves above our brothers. But we're one of our brothers, which is one of the points in, the, in Deuteronomy 17, verse 20. But also we need to be selfless. Let each of us not look into his own interests, but also to the interests of others, like Jesus. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Again, as the king was meant to not enrich himself, whether that is by military power, wives or wealth, but to selflessly serve his people in the same way Jesus emulated this, but we, in the end, follow Jesus here as well by being selfless, counting others' interests more important than our own interests. And there are other passages as well, but I'd say this is at least a summary of this part of Deuteronomy chapter 17.